the goodness of God, but to really comprehend the depth of the goodness of God and what that means for our life is actually a pretty big project. So I'm looking forward to spending an hour with you guys this morning to talk about the goodness of God. It's a good topic. As I was thinking about the goodness of God, I just was thinking about things that are good. And I'm going to ask you this morning to think about things that are good and things that are not good. So we'll do that a couple times throughout the um, lesson this morning. As I was thinking about things that are good, I, reminded of a, I was reminded of a trip I took in 2009 with John Buck. And you've probably heard, maybe some of you have heard about this trip before. John and I were blessed with the opportunity to fly from LA to Russia, um, really far north in Russia, to teach for a week on the attributes of God. And so it was a real fun uh, trip. On the way out there to Russia, John asked me, he said, Nick, are there any like food things that you don't like, that you don't think are very good? And I grew up as a pretty picky eater because I'm a texture-oriented kind of guy when it comes to eating. I didn't eat guacamole until I was 24 years old <laughs> just because of that like texture, right? I didn't think it was very, I mean, the flavor's good, but I couldn't get past the texture. For me, it wasn't good. So John asked this question, and I said, John, I'm trying to be like a flexible guy. When it comes to flavors, you know, it doesn't matter. I could do a spicy, I could do plain, whatever. But texture kind of gets me, and there's two things that I really just don't enjoy the texture of. One, as you'd probably guess, is cottage cheese. And I know some of you guys enjoy cottage cheese. That's totally okay. I just put the stuff in my mouth, and I'm like, oh, this texture's killing me. And I said, aside from that, it's probably got to be sour cream. And I know lots of people love sour cream. It doesn't taste bad. It's just the whole texture thing for me. It's just tough. So John and I stayed at the pastor's home who had organized this seminar for pastors from the, from the region. And on our last morning there, the pastor, Nikolai, is his name, he said to, to John and to me, he said, guys, we've got a real special treat for breakfast this morning. It's a Russian specialty. He said, it's cottage cheese. <laughs> and we mix it with sour cream. <laughs> no joke, you could ask John Buck. And I thought... In my mind, this is not good. <laughs> and I knew that my countenance was dropping because I looked over at John, and he was trying so hard to keep the laughter in. <laughs> and that was 2009. That's a, we're pretty far past that date, and we still laugh about that story. But it illustrates for us that in our minds, we can think about things that are good. And we can, even, we can see a phrase like, God is good. Or we say it to each other sometimes, though I'm pretty bad at doing it, when we say, God is good, and somebody responds all the time, and then you say all the time, God is good. It's kind of an easy phrase for us to talk about, but to really understand what good is can be kind of challenging. And that leads us into point two for the notes this morning. We want to try to gather up a definition of what good is. Because I could look at one thing and say, oh, cottage cheese and sour cream, that's not good. And somebody else could look at it and go, that's really good. So when we say God is good, we want to really step into that zone of discovery from the Bible to figure out what good really means. Because I can tell you that God is good, and this is going to lead into our application for this morning. We can say God is good. We could all affirm at Faith Bible Church that God is good. But then when something happens in our life that we think is not good, then it really calls into question, is God good or not? Or why is God not being good to me in this moment? And so I really hope through this whole lesson this morning that we would walk away with an understanding of the goodness of God that really leads into worshipful application for us, regardless of what kind of circumstances we face in life. So we can look at the challenge of defining good. The challenge of defining good. When you visit Merriam-Webster's online um, website, where you can just type in words, I just did it, the link's there, typed in good, you'll see that the first definition of good comes up as something that is good. So I think that kind of hints at the challenge that we have when we're talking about something good, because we kind of have these presuppositions. We assume that some things are good and some things are bad. Collectively, maybe as a culture, we think certain things are good, certain things are bad, whereas another culture might have a different perspective on that. So we're just kind of thinking, how would you define good? How would you really like nail that down, and have an absolute standard to describe something as good or not. Then when you search dictionary.com, you'll see these definitions, something that's morally excellent, virtuous, righteous, or pious. 
or number two there, satisfactory in quality, quantity, or degree. And I think that's the direction I want to go with our discussion this morning, or we could say something that is a, approved. Something that is good is something that we would approve of. Something that's approved, that we would say that's good. And I know like in these illustrations I'm using or just in, in the culture in which we live, we know that for people, the standard seems to shift with what good is and what good isn't. And what is that that is good? We could just say that what is good is that which is approved. Something that's, we'd say, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> See how hard it is to define what good is? We know, we, we have a sense of, we know what good is. It's that, is. it's that which is approved. It's that which is righteous, virtuous, pious. Any of these words that we could ascribe to that category of things that are good. Challenge for us is that when we're talking about God and his goodness, or when we're talking about goodness at all, we really want to grab those words and define them or place items in that category defined by the things that God would approve of, what God says is good. So that's what we're going to do a little bit today. You can consider the sobering words of Isaiah 5.2, where we read, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And you know that text well, right? You've heard it before. And I think we see the unfolding of that kind of reality in humanity, in our culture today. Um, and I know probably my grandpa probably said the same thing about his culture. I just think from my perspective as a 42-year-old, the world is moving that direction. We're just moving away from the ability to really nail something down as good or not, and people are confused. So we're just going to take a look at some simple Bible truths to help bring some clarity. So here's a theolog theological definition of good. The first quote that we have here says, The goodness of God means that God is the final standard of good and that all that God is and does is worthy of approval. Super simple, right? I tried to start from simple to a little bit more complex. I know Gus starts with the most complex and gets even more complex than that. I don't know how he does that, but his quotes are amazing that he has in his, in his notes. Here's just a simple idea for us. The goodness of God means that God is the final standard of good and that all that God is and does is worthy of approval. So when we're thinking in our minds, okay, good, that's something that's approved, something that's righteous, something that's honorable, something that's pious, whatever kind of words we want to describe to it, we're going to give it the thumbs up, two thumbs up, say that's something that's good. Then our easy definition from Wayne Grudem here in his systematic theology textbook is to simply see that God himself is good. Everything that he is and everything that he does is good. Simple truth, right? We'll see a little later on, though, the application of that, first in our hearts and then in our, our lives, could be a little more challenging. But we want to walk away from this le lesson today with a firm assurance that God is good. God is approved, not because we're going to approve him, but because he is God. And so with all that we've learned in equipping class so far, about God and his perfections, his immutability, all that he is as the uncreated one and the creator of all things, he is who he is. And he is the standard of good. So whenever we're going to talk about the goodness of God, we want to understand it in terms of not us judging God to see if he would fit our definition or our categorization of good, but the exercise that we have is to see who God is and say, oh, that's good, because God is good. He is the standard of what is good. He is good, and everything he does is good. So that helps us to then take a good deep breath when we're trying to figure out what good is, because we can just focus our attention on God and his character and his works, and then we've got our definition for us approved. It's what God approves of. It's who he is. That is what is good. And our second quote there is from John MacArthur in the big white theological um, or systematic theology textbook. Somebody want to read that for us? It's the second quote under a theological definition of good. Do you have it before you, Mitch? Do you mind read, reading that loud for us? God's goodness is that he is the perfect soul. Of that which is wholesome, and that 
doctors, you will be virtuous, beneficial, and beautiful. I appreciate the words that we, he- we see here as well. God is wholesome, virtuous, beneficial, beautiful. All those things that we would use to try to describe God, our goodness, that's God. And here, what I appreciate about this quote too, is that God's goodness is that he is the perfect sum, source, and standard. So anytime we're going to talk about something that's good, we're going to reflect back our thought, we're going to direct our thoughts to God, his character, who he is, and what he does, because everything that God is and everything that God does is good. And then in the next quote here, I'll read it out loud for us. It says, this attribute, and this is the more complex of my three quotes that I have here, this attribute, um, it, con- it contemplates as that which is within God is akin to his holiness. If contemplated as that which proceeds from God is akin to love. The infinite goodness of God is a perfection of his being which characterizes his nature and is itself the source of all in the universe that is good. So again, just re-emphasizing the fact that God is good. And when we look at God, when we, when we see what he does and who he is, then we recognize that he is the standard of good. There's, um, we also talked about in, earlier in equipping class how God is who he is. He exists in and of himself, and he is righteous because he is righteous. He's the standard of righteous. He is, he has the, like, he has these qualities of omnipotence even. And we talk about God's all powerful. The question came up that Gus asked for us. So if God's all powerful, can he make a rock that's so big that he can't lift it up? Something so heavy that he can't lift it? And we think, wow, that's a good question. But it's really not a good question, right? Because God in himself is the definition of what it is to be all powerful. And he can't break the definition of all powerful and still be all powerful. So he's not going to do something that's contrary to his nature. And that's the same or similar principle when we're talking about the goodness of God. He is good, and he always acts according to his goodness. So let's take a look at some Bible passages that just show that simple truth for us, starting with the idea that God is good and always does that which is good. Um, We have Psalm 100, verse 5. Psalm 100, verse 5. Chris, would you mind reading Psalm 100, verse 5 out loud for us? Thank you. For the Lord is good. One, two, three, four, five simple words that we have in the English text. And when we read through the Psalms, we see this idea that the Lord is good multiple times. Simply stated, the Lord is good. Only takes five words in the English language to reflect that God is the standard of good. And then if we go one step further, we can see that in the New Testament, Jesus describes God as the only one who is good. So we could Take a look at Mark 10, 18, for example. And if you remember the context of Mark chapter 10, Jesus is talking with a rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler asks the question, so what do I need to do in order to be saved? And so Jesus comes back to him with some ideas about what he needs to do, which really reflect the desires of his heart, which is such a good text to preach through. But when this rich, rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks, says to him, good teacher, what do I need to do to be saved? Then Jesus' answer to him, which we see in Mark 10, 18, is why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Which is super helpful in that context also because the rich young ruler is trying to figure out what we need to do in order to be good. And as the story unfolds, you see that he really had a pretty inflated view of himself, that he had this thing dialed. When it comes to keeping the commandments in the Old Testament, he was like, dude, I've got it covered. I've done it all. It's set. And Jesus is like, well, I don't think you understand. <laughs> like, you're looking at yourself thinking you got something good going on, but you need to focus your attention on God because God alone is good. He is the standard of what good is. So we look to him for that. Same passages uh, quoted in Luke 18. And then also we see something similar in Matthew 5, 48, where Jesus, talking about completeness and, f- and obedience, says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God is good and he's perfect in his goodness. 
not only is the Lord good, which might be the easier part for us to confess and affirm, the next point that I wrote down for us is that the Lord does good. So he is good. I know that kind of starting to tip into some of the application of today's message. It's easy for us to affirm the Lord is good. The Lord is good. But then, if we're going to also affirm that he always does good, sometimes we find question marks in our own lives. We'll get to that, though. But let's look at a couple passages that state real clear for us that everything that the Lord does is good. We'll start with the Old Testament, the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Nate, would you mind reading Genesis 1, 31 out loud for us? Thank you. Also a very uh, short passage, but remember in Genesis chapter 1, we're watching the unfolding of creation, and God does something. There's like light, and there's like day and night, and then we read multiple times in Genesis chapter 1, and it was good. God created something, and it was good. God saw that it was good, and it was good, and it was good. I think it comes around five times before we get to chapter 1, verse 31, and Moses is the author of this book, reflects on the fact for us that in creation, after six days of creating, everything that God had made wasn't just good. I appreciate the way we read it here in our text. It was very good. God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. That's what God does. He is a good God. His character defines what goodness is, and everything that flows from his hand is actually something that's good. So I think we can say, okay, That's a great point from the Old Testament, right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, that's before the fall, right? So we've got Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Did something change with Genesis chapter 3? And then we just go back to some of the Psalms again and say, absolutely not. It didn't change. Let's look at Psalm, it's actually 119. I think I wrote in your notes 118. That was just a typo. Miss, because Psalm, what's kind of interesting, Psalm 118 doesn't have 68 verses. Uh, Obviously, Psalm 119 has... uh, 68 verses, but then if you go, you don't have to do this, but I was like, oops, I wrote that wrong, and I just flipped over to Psalm 118, and the very last verse of Psalm 118, I think it's verse 28, essentially says the same thing, God is good. So just open up Psalms, and you'll probably find somewhere that God is good. It's such a prevalent topic for us. Um, So Psalm 119, verse 68. Jeremy, do you have a Bible open? You want to read that out loud for us? So now we're after the fall, right? That was the point I was trying to make. Genesis chapter 3, we see some bad things happen with humanity. Genesis chapter 4, it gets worse with humanity. Murder. Genesis chapter 5 is actually not better. You just see like a progression of names, right? This guy, he lived for so many years and he died. And then this guy, he lived for a while and he died. And this guy, he lived for a while and he died. It's it's not going well for humanity after Genesis chapter 3. And it essentially doesn't get better. (laughs) Uh, for humanity in the fall, right, on this earth. Yet the psalmist is able to write in reflection, you are good and do good. Simple words in our English text, you are good and do good. We're talking about six words. But the reality that God is good, the truth that God is good, and our belief in those six words and that simple truth even after the fall God is good. He is good, and everything he does is good. So then if we want to say, okay, Nick's repeated that in 20 minutes. He's probably said that 70 times, uh, that God is good, and everything he does is good. Then we can take a step back and say, okay, then if we just align our hearts with the scripture and say that God is good, he's the definition of good, everything he does is good, then we can take a step back and say, okay, that which is not good, which is not approved, or the things that are not good in our lives that we want to like categorize or define as not good are going to be the things that God does not approve of because God is good. So we see in Romans uh, chapter 1, we can flip open to the New Testament. We were in Genesis 1, now we go to Romans 1, a little bit longer of a passage, Romans 1, 18 through 32. We can see that rejecting God 
leads to unapproved behavior. Or rejecting God leads to bad. So following God and being like God leads to good. That's something good. And anything that steps outside of that definition of what God is, his character, what he approves of is going to be something that's bad. So we see that unfold in Romans 1, 18 through 32. It's a little bit longer of a passage. I'll read it out loud for us. You know this passage pretty well. But particularly towards the, in the middle and towards the end of our passage, there are some key words that just pop out for us and help us to think, okay, when I want to understand that God is good and try to really get a grasp of what good is, God lays it out for us. And he says his character, all that he is, and what he describes himself as is good. And anything that starts to fall out of that, that framework that God gives us, that's bad. So this is how it unfolds in Romans 1, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And that word unrighteousness should maybe pop out for us because one of the first definitions I read this morning for good included the word righteousness for God. So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all un ungodliness, everything outside of his character, and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The truth of what? God and his character. <laughs> For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Okay, pause here for a minute. Isn't that what I've said this morning so far? Everything that God does is good. His creation is good. What he created is good. I understand we're cursed. We can talk about that a little later. But when we look into even the general revelation around us, how the sunrise, and this is such a cool time of year in Southern California, isn't it? Has anybody been watching the sunsets lately? Yeah. Friday evening, I was down by 204s to get some exercise on those 204 stairs, if you know the staircase there. And it was amazingly beautiful. The sun sets, the sun rises, like clock, it is like clockwork, right? I could even go on Google right now, and if I wanna surf on March 13th of 2024, dawn patrol, early in the morning with my daughter Bryn, because that's her birthday, and I think, okay, when is the sun gonna rise? I can go on to Google and I can get the time in San Clemente, I can't even get, I get the tides. The only thing I can't get is the surf report yet. But I know when the sun's going to rise. I know what the tide's going to be like. I know what beach we could go to. If we should hit 204s or maybe Doheny or we can go down south to Sanos. I know all those things because God has created the world to be that way. And we just look into the general revelation and we see the goodness of God. I didn't plan on this illustration, but just one step to the side. Um, having a baby is, is just a cool reflection of God's goodness. And so uh, I remember Shane's here in the back. And he's like, no, dad, don't talk about me, please. I remember when Shane was born and don't, I know this is being recorded. No other clan of kids are here. Don't tell them, please. <laughs> but there's something special about that firstborn. <laughs> they're all special. <laughs> they're all special and they're all beautiful babies. But I just remember when Shane was born, just thinking, oh, this is so cool. And you see the goodness of God reflected in childbirth, in surfing in the morning. Um, I'm a huge fan of food, right? Uh, you'll learn every time, I, every time I teach, I have to talk about steak a little bit. Uh, I'm a big steak fan. And I just, when I get a real good steak that's cooked to medium rare, a little bit like just seasoned with salt, and it's just extremely flavorful, like a ribeye that's been grilled on a really hot grill, so that's like red in the middle, but crust and all. Are you hungry now for breakfast? Steak and eggs for breakfast, anyone? <laughs> when I just, and I know it's so simple and silly, right? The general revelation, when we see what God has done and we see that we're allowed to enjoy something like steak, and it's so good. And you just think, oh, God is like, it's just, it's good. What he does is good. So Paul's writing for us here, back to Romans. Sorry for the uh, rabbit trail. His invisible attributes, verse 20 from Romans chapter 1, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, they've been clearly perceived ever since the recreation of the world in the things that have been made. So we should just be able to look around at creation and see God's invisible attributes so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, this is the problem with people who step outside 
of the goodness of God and what he is and who he is and what he does, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their, fo- and, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They were claiming to be wise, but they became fools and exchanged the glory. And think about that word glory here. I know it's not the word good, but you think about glory. Wouldn't we attribute the word glory to that category of things that are good? Like we don't, we don't, I know. This goes back to the Isaiah 5 passage. Sometimes people will call that which is bad, good. But if we're just thinking in a, just a pure theological sense, anything that's glorious, like God himself, the simple truths of the gospel, when we think about that, that Jesus, the perfect son of God, has died for me, a sinner, and we just think that's a glorious truth, then we, we usually, at least I would, take that word glory and I go, oh, yeah, something that's glorious, that's good. So people, when they're stepping outside of God and his character and God and his works, they're claiming to be wise, they become fools, and they exchange that glory, the goodness of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. How silly is that? That we would step out as humanity, that we'd step outside of the character of God, which is good, because he himself is the definition of good. Romans 1.24, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to, and then here we start to see some words in our text that describe those things that are outside of the category of goodness. They gave themselves up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the, cre- the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Then in verse 26 of Romans chapter 1, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable, key word for us also in our text, right? Because we were just, I was just trying to explain how something that is glorious, something that is honorable, fits into that category of God and his character. Whatever truly is honorable is going to be a reflection of God's character. So whatever is dishonoring steps outside of the reflection of God's character, and that's just bad. It's bad. It's not good. They gave, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And then here's some examples for us. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless. Also that word could be a key word for us when we're trying to think of that which is good and conforms to God's character. Shameless acts with men and receiving in, them, in themselves the due penalty of their error. Again, outside of that character of God. Then Romans 1, 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, it's the pattern that we've set for us. The goodness of God, what is good? God himself is good. They refused to acknowledge that. They did not look at that framework of who God is in his character and affirm what he does and say, okay, that is good, so I'm going to conform my understanding of good to God. They didn't see fit to acknowledge God God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of, and here's some serious list, a serious list of key words for us, unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Whew. All that stuff are things that are bad and fall outside of the character of God because God would never do that. He would never be engaged in that. He would never have a thought that even comes across his mind that is, un, that is dishonorable. God would never have the slightest hint or inkling, you know, like desire to do anything that involves gossip, slander, murder, foolishness, heartlessness, ruthlessness, not even close to God's character because God is good. And everything that God is and everything that God does is the definition of good for us. God is good. That's what the goodness of God means. And the Bible unfolds in different passages for us, all the stuff that falls outside of that goodness. And the Bible tells us real clear, don't do it. (laughs) Don't let your thoughts conform to that kind of pattern, and this is also like inching us into the application for this morning, 
Don't let your thoughts conform to that pattern where when we're trying to analyze what is good and what is not good in our lives, that we step outside of the character of God and let our own thoughts, our own character, or anything that is contrary to who God is and what he does take over our hearts so that we define that which is bad as good. Because God is good. And he is good all the time. And everything that he does is good. Okay, so then we could also see in Galatians 5 that that which comes from the flesh is unapproved. You know this list in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. Uh, we won't read the whole passage, but starting in verse 16 of Galatians, we see the instruction that we're supposed to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And we know that they fight against each other. We experience that in our own lives where even like Romans 7, things that we think we should be doing and we ought to be doing, it's hard for us to do those things. The things that we know we shouldn't be doing, we tend to do those kind of things, and it drives us crazy. So Paul's instruction in Galatians 5 is to walk by the Spirit, uh, not be controlled by the flesh. And then he gives us a, a list of, and this is again in the bad category, of things that we need to avoid because they fall outside of the goodness of God. They fall outside of the character of God. Um... Richard, would you mind reading Galatians 5, 19 through 21 out loud for us? Thank you, sir. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, strife, envying, drunkenness, carousing, things like these, of which I have warned you, just as I formed you. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, self control. Great, thank you. So, even in that passage in 19 through 21, where we see the fruit of the flesh, really, the things that come out of our flesh, just falls in that category of things that are outside of the character of God. And we read through that list, and at least for those of us who have spend some time in the church and reading the Bible. Like our heart, we read that and we're like, yeah, we affirm that to be true. Verses 19 through 21, those are bad things. Like we don't want to engage in those things. We can say, yeah, that's bad. Those are the things that fall outside of God's character. And then in verse 20, at the end of 21, Paul warns us that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is a kingdom characterized by God. And his kingdom is a good kingdom because God is good. And so Paul, even in this simple explanation of the spirit and the flesh, he says, you know, if you're going to be godly, if you're going to spend time with God, or if you're going to be in heaven with God, then it's only going to conform to God and his character because God is good. And everything outside of God's character, which is the list here for us, Paul says it's a no-go. It's bad, bad stuff for us. And then also in verse 22, like we saw, those are the fruit of the Spirit. And so that's a reflection of God's character. So we look at those things and we're like, yeah, those are good. Yeah, those are absolutely good because those are reflection of who God is and what he does. And then what's interesting, I think about Galatians 5.21 and Paul's statement that those who are engaged in things that are not good things that are contrary to God's character, they are not going to inherit the kingdom of God because when we connect that with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, then I would say, and I know, I think it's a pretty good thought. I learned it from somebody else. <laughs> There's no original thought with Nick Kalina. Um, hell is essentially the absence of God's goodness. So when we talk about God being a good God, and we read these passages that tell us that all that God has created is good, Genesis 1.31, even after the fall, God is good and he does good, then the idea of hell, I don't think is so much an idea of like, oh, you're going to be punished. Like you are, it is going to be a place of punishment, but what is the punishment? And we tend to think through the illustrations that we hear like, oh, it's like burning fire, but it's dark. And I'm trying to like make sense of that in our minds. But I think from, we have a good argument from 2 Thessalonians 1 that 
being apart from God and his goodness forever is going to be the worst thing that we could ever experience. Just being outside of the goodness of God that we enjoy. Because even here, in a fallen world, we still enjoy the goodness of God. And God is good to those who are righteous and unrighteous here on this earth. God is just, and I, I know this is a side note too. I got a couple minutes. We talk about God's grace, which is amazing because God is gracious. And I 100% affirm that God is gracious and shows us grace. I prefer, and it's just a preference, I prefer to say that God is good to unbelievers because he is gracious in salvation. And I like to save that word for God's conduct with believers. Now, that doesn't mean that God does not give good things to those who are unbelievers. He certainly does. And I like to say that's God's goodness. It's a reflection of his goodness. And I like to save grace for salvation. We can talk about that later, too. I could be corrected. It's not an absolute uh, theological truth I would die on, but I just, or die for, but I just think it's a good point. So God is good, and in his goodness, now, the whole world gets to enjoy good things. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I, I wrote down verse 9 here. If you, kind of, if you look in the context, um, Paul's saying, hey, it's, he's affirming the Thessalonians and saying they're doing a good job, and they've suffered for the sake of the gospel. And so he's trying to encourage and teach the Thessalonians that Jesus is going to come back at some time, verse 8. And when Jesus comes back a second time, he's going to come in flaming fire, and he's, he's, going to, he's going to be upset, particularly to those who do, who do not obey the gospel. So this is the description of what they are going to endure, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Those people who do not obey the gospel, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So I think Paul gives us a definition here or an explanation of what hell would be like. It will be a place of punishment. It will be a place of sadness. What's, what's sad about it? And this is like, again, dipping into our application, which comes pretty quick anyway here. Um, sometimes when we think of heaven, not here at FBC, because I understand how we preach and teach here at the church, but sometimes when we think about heaven, we think about good things, right? Think about like steak for every meal, <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Or we, th- we think about like warm water at Dawn Patrol, like all the time, right? With no other surfers out in perfect waves. Like, oh, that's, that's like, that's heaven, right? Or like we think about like our physical bodies too. And we're like, oh, it's going to be so nice not to be sore anymore. Um, I am to that point in my life where I'm sore more often than I'm not <laughs> sore, I think. And you do like the littlest workout and it's like, oh man, I feel that for two days. Like, how could that be? Uh, others who are young and strong, they work out all the time. Oh, I don't even feel it. Um, so we think about heaven. It's like, oh yeah, there's not going to be any pain. There's not going to be any like sickness. I'm tired of being sick. It would just be great to be like strong and like that, that, that's awesome. That's, that's, and then hell's going to be like the opposite of that. I guess we're going to be sick all the time and it's going to be, it's going to be flat and blown out. There's not going to be any waves and we're going to have to eat Brussels sprouts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's going to be just a disaster. So we think about those things, right? But really, like a biblical perspective of hell and a biblical perspective of heaven is that heaven is being with God. And that's going to be so good because God is good. So that whole, just that whole idea of like, what does it mean to be good? What, what is something that's good? We're just going to look at God and we're going to be like, wow, he is good. That's what goodness is. That's what glory is. That's, what, that's, that's glorious. That's honorable. That's pious. That's righteous. That is good. And that's God. And then for those who are cast out of his presence, they are going to be so empty because of the distance between them and their existence and all that goodness of God. And there's nothing good to enjoy because they don't have God. It's not that Brussels sprouts are the punishment. It's the absence of God's goodness that is the punishment. I don't like Brussels sprouts, by the way, if you didn't pick up that already. So I will eat them, especially when they're coated in bacon uh, and lots of grease and fat. Oh, that's... Helps them slide down. But other than that, oh, they're not my favorite. So, so God is good. He is the definition of goodness. He is everything that's good. Then we have a couple more. Um, yeah, we have actually a lot of passages to look at. Um, but we won't look at all of them. 
Let's just look at a few of these, some passages about God's goodness now that we've kind of explained what God's goodness is, what good is, what bad is. God is good. His character is good. Everything he does is good. So then anything that falls outside of that framework is something that's bad. And we just want to be the kind of people that know God so well that we can affirm that he is good and what conforms to his goodness. So then we have passages. We already read Genesis 1, 31 and the story of creation, that everything that God created is good. In Psalm 34, verse 8 is a passage I'll read out loud. You probably know this one well because we sing it sometimes in songs. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord is good. Psalm um, 84, verse 11. I'm just wondering... Yeah, Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. And written in a negative way, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Or Psalm 106, verse 1. Can somebody open that real uh, quickly for us? I know we weren't in Psalm in the last passage, but Psalm 106, verse 1 is an encouragement for our hearts. Somebody, somebody's flipped there fast. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Thanks, Mitch. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good. And here in this passage, which you also see later in Psalm 136, repeated often, his steadfast love endures forever. And just a reflection of God and his character. When we think through the simple gospel truths, we're like, man, that's good. God's love endures forever. Um, Matthew 7, 7, I won't read out loud so we can have a little more time to talk about application. That's where um, Jesus explains, though, that if a heavenly or an earthly father gives good stuff, like if my kid asks for bread, I'm not going to give him a rock or a snake or something weird. Um, if I could do that with my kids, then our heavenly father, he can, he can, he's so good. He can give us good things. He's far beyond that. Romans 8, 28, I'll read out loud for us. Um, and in some of these other passages we'll look at later, but 828, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So that's a good transition into the application portion of uh, today's lesson. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And I understand that um, in hard times, this verse comes up, right? And we want to be real careful, as a, also as a side note, when we're um, just ministering the word to each other and counseling each other, that we're not too quick to pull this one out of the holster when something's going bad for somebody else because um, we want to come alongside of our brothers and sisters with empathy and sympathy and just put ourselves in their shoes. Because we can affirm, even this whole morning, right? I've, God, God is good. <laughs> Super simple words. Um, we only need five letters in the English alphabet to, to write out that God is good. Isn't that funny? Five letters of the English alphabet to say that God is good. It's easy for us to affirm that. Say, okay, yeah, that's true. God is good. But then, when those things come in life, which would be here encapsulated in the idea of all things in Romans 8, 28. When things come into our lives where we're like thinking, oh, I don't know if that's good. Like, I don't like that. Um, that's a trial for me. Or that's painful for me. Or I, just, I, don't, I don't like this. We're tempted to think, okay, in that moment, okay, I see that God is good. I can affirm that God is good. There's a lot of passages that we've read this morning that say God is good. But in this moment, can I really like, affirm that God is good in my heart? Do I believe it to be true? And can I embrace that which God is doing in my life right now as something good? And I think that's where it's challenging. So the side note is we want to be careful when we come alongside of our brothers and sisters. And we use this passage because we don't want to just see somebody suffering and throw that on like as sugar on top. And be like, oh, it's going to be okay. Uh, it's, life is hard. We can affirm that to be true after the fall, it's just the reality of our life that we are all decaying. Um, remember in Genesis chapter 3, the curse that was given is that we would return to the dust, for from the dust we came, you will surely die, was actually the 
the warning of Genesis chapter 2. You will surely die if you eat of the, of the tree. Knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve did that. And then the curse comes to fruition. You're going you're gonna to die. You're going to return to dust. And the reality is, even though it's kind of, I know, sometimes we talk about death at my, at my kids. Uh, and some of my kids are like, Dad, why do you always got to talk about death and bad things? Because it puts God's goodness in a particularly helpful perspective. So from the day that we're born, in that wonderful moment I was talking about, where my little Shane was there, he's no longer little, but uh, my firstborn son, oh, this is such a cool thing. That was October uh, 5th of 2004. Ever since October 5th of 2004, my son is actually on a path towards death. It's kind of a weird thought, I know. It's like Sunday morning, we're supposed to be encouraging. Just let me, let me let out the bad news so we can get to the good news, right? Um, so then our kids grow up big and strong, and they're, they're just flourishing as teenagers, and they appear as if they can conquer the world, and they're going to be heroes. And that lasts until sometime in our life where we're starting to 42. Notice that every time you work out, it hurts, which is not bad. I, I've got plenty of years ahead of me, Lord willing. But we just notice, like, mm, this isn't going to go, this isn't going to get, I'm not going to get bigger, right? I'm just going to maintain, and the reality is I hope to maintain because we start to fall apart through time. It, it's the way that it is in this world. So when we are suffering, which we will in this life, in our physical bodies, which doesn't necessarily mean we have to suffer in our hearts and our spirits, we just want to be careful how we bring that, oh yeah, just sprinkle some sugar on top of it, it's all good. The reality is it is all good, but how do we get to that point where we believe it to be good? All these things that are challenging in our life. That's where we see Romans 12, 2 come in, into play for us. We didn't read it in the list of uh, verses there, but in Romans 12, 2, Paul writes for us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the task that we have in light of the goodness of God is to transform our thinking to conform to God's goodness. And when we can think like God thinks, then we'll be able to see whatever comes our way, all things, Romans 8, 28, and we'll be able to say, this is from the hand of God, and this is good. I can embrace, embrace it as good, even when it is something that is not so good. So then you can ask, okay, doesn't that sound like nonsense? Is Nick just trying to like play mind tricks with us this morning? Because I'm not totally getting that. I want to conform my mind to the things that God thinks so that I think the way he thinks, so that when I experience anything in my life, I can embrace that as good. But aren't the things that happen in my life bad because they fall outside of God's goodness, like death? Like God's not going to die. He's everlasting. He's, he's unchanging. God doesn't die, but we die. God doesn't have to endure the things that we endure. So the things that come at us are bad, aren't they? Well, here's the like con the thought conform or the conforming thoughts. Here's how we need to conform our thoughts. Um, look over at the last point with me. What are the implications of this doctrine? And the verse that I really want to look at with you is Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, because this puts the goodness of God in our fallen world into super helpful perspective for us when we're encountering things that we think, this is not good. Philippians chapter 3, you can open it if you have your phone with you. Um, Please take a look at it. This is a real important passage for the application portion today. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Though you might know Philippians chapter 3, and Paul gave a, a cool list of things that he had accomplished in life. To be true to the context, he went to, had a good education, born from good parents, had a good education. He was on his way to be a super cool dude. Uh, is my summary of the things that Paul was able to uh, gain in his earthly life. And then in verse 7, he says, Whatever gain I had, that whole list of cool stuff, whatever it was, the reality is I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, 
but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So let's connect two ideas in this paragraph that help us reflect on the goodness of God and affirm and believe in the goodness of God, whatever happens in my life. So he wrote, Paul wrote, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything that could be good, could be to my advantage, could be gain here in this world. I count everything as loss because of, and you know this word, right? This is like burn into all of our scripture memory exercises. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth. Now think about surpassing. We're talking about things that are good, right? Paul's talking about something that's really good here. And he's like, yeah, there's, okay, so steak, yeah, good. We can even start on the spectrum with um, Brussels sprouts, right? Uh, Brussels sprouts, not good, right? Then we've got Dawn Patrol, good, steak, really good. And then knowing Christ, surpassing worth, all of this stuff that might be gain in our lives, that we might consider as good for our lives, the health, the money that we have, this, just the smoothness of life, the things would actually work or that your plans would come to fruition, or that you'd have some kind of security. Whatever it is that we count as good in this world and in this life, Paul brings to light this idea, you know what? You could lose all that stuff. It could be gone, and we could still affirm from our hearts that God is good because even in the loss of all these things here in this world, we have a surpassing treasure. It's knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so in that perspective, when we start connecting these dots and see that God is good all the time and everything that God does is good, then when something that happens to you seems like something bad, the theological affirmation that we need to have from our hearts is this is actually for my good. That doesn't mean we need to label something that's bad as good. Did you catch that? I know it's Sunday morning and I used a preposition that's really important, and I just used a grammar term, which I should avoid. Um, it's not that we are going to get sick and call our sickness, oh, that's good. Like, I would affirm as well that cancer in and of itself is not good. It's the body not functioning how it should, right? How God created it. Cancer is bad. Um, if it's hard in our society to run out of money, have no funds, right? That's, it's not a, I wouldn't say, okay, you, you're really struggling financially. I wouldn't say, oh, well, the, the like, lack of funds is a good thing. It's just, it might not be good. Um, all those things that could happen, we don't have to label those as good things, but we know since God is good and everything he does is good, that those things that come into our lives are for our good. And they are for our good because if we really get behind Philippians chapter 3, then everything that we experience in life, whether it seems like a positive for us or a negative, whether it seems like a blessing or part of the curse in this life, everything that we have, everything that comes to us in life is really for the sake of us to know Christ better. And that's where we connected that, that idea from verse 7 to the end of our paragraph here, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings. So even in suffering in this world, and suffering in this life, when I have an opportunity to grow in faith, and to know Jesus better, then I've really won. And that's something that's good, because if we just go back to the very first words that we said this morning, God is good. And if through the loss of funds, through the loss of time, through the loss of sleep, through the loss of wealth, through the loss of health, whatever it is that I lose, through the loss of relation or through challenges and relationships, or through doing things that we don't really want to do but we need to do, through all these things, when we grow in faith and we know Jesus better and we're conformed, we're just we're just in fellowship with Him through suffering and through the power of His resurrection. When we become like Him in death, even by any means possible, that we might attain the resurrection from the dead. That we, might just, that we might conform to God's goodness and that we might experience God's goodness, then that's for our gain. And then we can say from our hearts, man, God is good. Whatever happens in our life, because simple words that we've read a hundred times this morning, 
God is good, and everything he does is good. So, in the spirit of um, our fearless leader, Gus, I did try to find a psalm, or not a psalm, a, um, a hymn that has to do with God's goodness. So, I have this one that I found, The Goodness of God. Um, I am not, like, the hymnology expert, so it actually took me some time to find this, um, and I was pretty excited that I actually hit that goal. So, uh, Dave, Connie, are you mind reading it? Do you have it in front of you? Do you mind reading the text of the song out loud for us? Well, thanks, Dave. Let me pray and thank God for his goodness. God in heaven, we do want to thank you for uh, who you are. As we walk through this um, series in equipping class, looking at your attributes, Lord, we have to affirm that you are good in every one of your attributes and that who you are and what you do, Lord, you define for us what good is. And Lord, it's a fun exercise to walk through some of these simple Bible passages that declare that you are good, that you do good, that you're steadfast love endures forever. Those are an encouragement to us. But Lord, we do know that it's challenging for us in light of some of the circumstances that we encounter in life to really believe from our hearts that you are good or that you're doing something good for us. So Lord, we pray that you'd help us to walk away from this morning knowing that even in the challenges, the trials, the temptations, the sufferings that we have here on earth, Lord, that those things are tools that lead us to you and when we're connected to you, then we're experiencing your goodness because you are good. Lord, we want to worship you that way. We want to, just, we want to conform in our own hearts and our lives, the things that we say, the things that we do. We want to conform to your goodness. Lord, we don't want to step outside of that framework into any of these things that we read about uh, this morning. Lord, so we pray that you'd be gracious to us. Lord, help us to live a life that's honoring to you. Lord, help us to reflect that goodness. And I pray too, as we're working through the book of Acts in our care groups, that you'd help our lives to so reflect your goodness that it provides for us opportunities to speak of your goodness to us through salvation in Christ and in Christ alone. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Let me just... Uh,